Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's ISPLS webinar. My name is Kayla Jenkins, and I'm the Senior Communications Coordinator at the Indiana Society of Professional Land Surveyors, and I'm glad that you all could join us for our presentation today. So if you look over in the GoToWebinar toolbar, you'll see several options there um, to help you maximize your webinar experience. So the red arrow will allow you to collapse or expand your control panel. Um, you can also adjust your audio settings there in the audio tab. We will take questions at the end of the webinar, so please type those into the question box at any time throughout the presentation so that we can moderate them to our presenter. Our speaker is happy to share his slides for today's presentation after the webinar, so stay on the lookout for a follow-up email from Daniel that will include today's slide handouts. So to earn your CEU credit for attending today's webinar, you must stay on the webinar for the entire presentation. You'll need to complete the quiz that pops up at the end and also earn a passing score on that quiz. And lastly, watch for a follow-up email from us that will be sent out sometime next week um, that will include the CEU certificate you're earning today, as well as a link to the recording for this session. So our speaker, speaker today is Daniel Katz. He is the co-founder of Arotas, where he has helped hundreds of surveyors nationwide start surveying by drone with industry-leaning accuracy. Daniel regularly speaks at surveying conferences across the country, and he's also a regular contributor to Point of Beginning and State Survey Association magazines. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Daniel, who will lead our presentation today. All right, thank you so much, Kayla. I'm just sharing my screen. All right, looks like we should be all set. Uh, thank you all so much for taking time out of your Thursday to join me here. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to be here as a guest of, of Kayla and the ISPLS. Uh, as Kayla mentioned, I'm a, uh, a co-founder of Aerotoss. And by way of quick introduction of, of what we do over at Aerotoss, uh, our mission is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're all about helping surveyors uh, maximize the benefit they can get from drone technology. Uh, we've worked with several hundred surveyors in about 35 states at this point um, and conduct, you know, and processed several thousand uh, drone land survey projects. Uh, and generally what we do is, is two main things. When we work with surveyors, uh, we can help surveyors launch their drone program. So those of you who haven't yet started using a drone in your survey operations but are thinking about it, that's something that we can, uh, can help out with, providing a drone, providing training and the like. Uh, and then we provide, help you get line work on every project by providing photogrammetry and uh, CAD drafting service. Uh, now, the reason that this, uh, this background about what we do is, is important to what I'm going to be going through today is because uh, what I aim to share with you all today are a lot of the, uh, the hard-learned lessons uh, we have learned in working with this technology uh, for, uh, for land surveyors uh, really since the early days of the technology. Uh, now, we are a an independent company. We're independent of drone hardware manufacturers. We're independent of any specific software providers. Um, so what I'm going to walk you through are basically um, how we have, how we kind of analyze the market for the state of drone technology, um, how we determine what we think are uh, the right tools, uh, drone related tools for land surveyors to, to use today, what workflows we use when um, when helping land surveyors start off using a, using a drone as a survey tool as well as in that data processing. Uh, so I'm gonna be reporting back to you how we kind of analyze the landscape and determine what we think um, provide the best results uh, for folks like yourselves. So you know, before diving into uh, the kind of technical components and the workflow and, and the like, it's important to, to level set about why, why a, a drone is a valuable tool for a land surveyor. Uh, and at, at this point in time, there are a lot of land surveyors around the entire country who are using drones, but we often find that they, they are, are looking for different things. Um, now, what we have found in our experience is the biggest benefit of using a drone for land survey work is all about efficiency. It's all about time savings. Used correctly, a drone is a massive, massive time saver on the right types of survey jobs. Uh, get into a little bit uh, some details on the types of, of jobs that we find it and, uh, find drones to be most valuable for, but figure uh, topographic work, uh, heavy planimetric work like ALTAs, things like that. Uh, really, the main benefit here is that the, the drone is 
It's a force multiplier. It allows you to do more work faster with fewer people. Uh, it also, of course, does have a handful of other benefits as well. Uh, used correctly, it's, it's a great record keeping tool. Uh, allows you to reduce the chance of missing shots out in the field and having to do return, uh, return trips. And similarly with that record, it's a great dispute resolution tool. We have lots of, of uh, stories from clients about how you know, what would have been an intractable problem to have to wrestle through with a client just goes away when you can look at the imagery together and say, hey, this is what the site looked like when we were out there that day. Um, you also, you know, with that, that imagery makes for happier CAD technicians, uh, engineers, and customers because they're working directly off of that uh, or, or can work with that high resolution imagery behind it rather than trying to interpret uh, sometimes inscrutable uh, field shot notes. Uh, and of course, um, you can make more money uh, by providing more valuable deliverables by uh, offering you know, to, to have, provide this, this high resolution imagery at, at a premium. Now, having said that, what I'm, a lot of what I'm going to be focusing on as I'm kind of framing this conversation is going to be that, that first main benefit, that reducing the amount of time it takes that you're using a drone to reduce the amount of time it takes a surveyor to complete uh, most of their projects. So the workflow that we have identified that, uh, that we have most success with uh, and that we coach, coach our clients on uh, basically consists of six steps. Uh, you've got your, your pre-work, you've got your field work, and then you've got your office work. So the first step, and candidly, this is one where we see a lot of folks stumble as they're starting off with this technology, is the project planning step. Before even going out to the field, a lot of times before even, uh, or as part of even bidding a project, this is a, a critical step of thinking through, what do I actually need to get out of this project? What are, what are my specs? Therefore, what kind of accuracy do I, or where am I going to rely on the drone versus what am I going to collect in the field? Uh, therefore, what kind of accuracy do I need to get uh, to expect from that drone data, which is going to determine things like how high you fly, where and how many ground control targets you set and the like. Uh, so really, you know, before even leaving the office, having this battle plan of how you're going to attack that project, how you're going to utilize the, this tool uh, as part of that project. Once you're on site, uh, your first step uh, for the, the, uh, using the drone is going to be setting uh, ground control targets. I'll get into some, uh, some specifics in a moment, but Short version is it's, it's fairly straightforward. Based on where you, what your, your project plan consists of, you're gonna go out around the field site, you're gonna set targets on the ground, you're gonna use your, uh, your survey equipment, your GPS or your total station to uh, locate those targets to a really high degree of accuracy. And ultimately that's what's gonna be used to anchor down that, that model. Uh, once you've completed that, you've got the actual data collection step, setting up the autopilot uh, in, uh, or refining the autopilot in the field as needed. Uh, doing a little bit of basic setup and calibration on the drone, and then letting the, dr the drone do its job. Flies overhead in a lawnmower pattern, completely autopilot controlled, uh, while the surveyor is holding on to the control, keeping an eye on the, the sky, making sure you don't have that crop duster or emergency helicopter come flying through. At this point, you've got hundreds or even thousands of photos, depending on the size of the project. You need to turn that into uh, something you can actually use. Uh, first step here is photogrammetry. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, those of you who are, who are experienced with conventional aerial photogrammetry, drone-based photogrammetry flips a little bit of the methodology on its head, but ultimately same general concept where you're taking raw photos, you're stitching them together into an ortho photo and into a 3D model. Now that, that 3D model, it's, it's huge. Now whether you work from a point cloud or as we prefer work from a digital surface model, Generally speaking, these files are too big, they're too rich to be able to just bring straight over into CAD. So there's a critical intermediary step here. This is another place where we often see folks really struggle when they're starting off, where you need to actually reduce that model down into something CAD can handle. Our approach to doing that is taking the digital surface model out of that photogrammetry process, uh, bring it into a specialized software uh, that allows us to just draft line work and take spot elevations directly from that 3D model and then we export that out as CAD data and we bring that over into Civil 3D or AutoCAD, it basically functions as totally standard CAD data. Um, so it basically allows us to kind of survey in this virtual environment and then export out you know, spot elevations, break lines, features, contours and the like. And the last step, you're almost always going to have field sh uh, shots that you collected in the field. Uh, the drone is it's a tool in the toolbox. It's good. It's right for parts of a job. There can always be parts of a job that you need to do on the field, uh, in the field, though, because you need them at higher accuracy. 
Uh, so your last step is bringing all that data together into CAD, merging it together, and using that to create your final surface. Now, I'm going to kind of get into this step-by-step this -step workflow, but before you can even go out and do your first project, uh, you have to obviously build out your drone program. You have to decide what are the, the components you're going to put in place. And obviously, the first big question everybody always has is what kind of drone should I get? So what I want to walk you all through is the process we use, the kind of analytical framework we use to, to evaluate all the drones that are out there on the market. And there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of different models out there. Um, a big part of our job is going out and testing everything we can get our hands on to determine what is going to uh, deliver the best results for land surveyors. Now, the way it can be really tempting when you're going out and you're comparing different drones to focus on kind of what's exciting or, or the, the long laundry list of tech specs. And you know, we'll, we'll even hear about folks who are comparing battery voltages on this model versus that model. And, and you can easily pull your hair out looking at every tech, uh, tech spec under the sun. Instead, what we really try to focus on and encourage you to when you're evaluating different models is what actually matters in the type of work you're going to be doing. And that's not necessarily something like uh, you know, camera, uh, camera sensor size, but actually field tested accuracy. When you take this, this drone out to the field, you do uh, projects with it, you ground truth, you take field shots, field shots to compare the amount of error you get from that drone data versus from your field data. What is the actual accuracy you wind up with? And of course, uh, the other part of this that matters is, is not just the accuracy, but how much ground can you cover at that accuracy? You know, if you can get uh, a few hundredths accuracy, but you can only cover uh, a few hundred square feet per day, then it's not actually going to be saving you any time. It's not necessarily worth the investment. So the question to be asking is, how much grand ground can you cover per hour, say, at the level of accuracy that you're going to need for your project? That's kind of the base of the period. Man. That's, that's ultimately the most important question if you're going to be using this for survey work. The second question to look into is reliability. And this is one that, that folks tend not to think about it until they, they, they have a, some bad experiences that teach them to. Uh, a lot of drone technology is still pretty new and it's pretty untested. Um, and there are a lot of drones out there that have really, really great tech specs, uh, but they're not very proven. They're, they're boutique, uh, you know, small production, specialized, uh, specialized drones that are inclined to have a lot of issues when used uh, on a day-by-day -day -day basis. And you want this to be a tool that you can rely on. Again, if the main benefit you're looking for is saving time out in the field, that means you need to know that every time you take the drone out of the truck, it's going to function just like it did yesterday and just like it will, it will tomorrow. If you wind up having to spend you know, your evenings and weekends, much less your work days, uh, fixing, tinkering, recalibrating, retooling, experimenting, then you're, you're losing that, a lot of that benefit. So when we think about reliability, what we really focus on um, is simplicity. We like to find, you know, a drone is a pretty complex tool, so we like to find the one that, it, the, the, the models that are the least complex. Fewest moving parts, fewest things that are interchangeable and liable to break, and that does require the least maintenance as well. And then of course, the critical last factor is price. Uh, ultimately, this is only worth doing if you can make money on it. Uh, so buying a super, super expensive drone, that may be able to get you really great results, but it's going to put your business under a ton of pressure to maximize uh, the amount that you can use that drone to try to make your money back. And, and I've seen a lot of folks wind up having to make pretty uh, not great business decisions because they're desperately trying to earn their money back on a really, really expensive drone. So let me dig into some of the key uh, kind of components to think about, the key variables, I suppose, in, uh, or pieces of technology uh, to think about when, when evaluating which drone to buy. Inter first up is the type of airframe. Uh, what is the actual flying vehicle? And there's three broad types. You've got small multi-rotors, DJI Phantom 4 Pro is kind of the, the leader of the pack here. Uh, unique H520 is another really great model in that category. Uh, generally about a foot and a half in diameter, a couple pounds all in, including all the support gear you're going to need, insurance, all that, you're probably looking at about $4,000 uh, and capable of, of getting you to a tenth accuracy reliably. Large multi-rotors, these are going to be more like a few feet in diameter. diameter. Uh, DJI makes a couple, a couple models as well as micro drones that are, that are pretty common. Uh, you know, depending on what you're carrying, it could be you know, 10 upwards of 30 pounds, um, considerably more expensive, uh, looking at that kind of all in, including the sensor and the, the support equipment and insurance. 
you know, twenty thousand dollars is kind of on the low end. They can easily get upwards of fifty to seventy thousand uh, dollars. And also looking at generally speaking, capable capable of about a tenth. And then the, uh, the the last major type are fixed wings. Uh, so whereas multi rotors are going to fly like helicopters, they can take off and land vertically. They can uh, hover. They can fly really slow. They can make right angle turns. Fixed wings fly like airplanes. Take off at a at a slope. They take wide banking turns. They have to maintain a minimum flight speed in order to stay aloft. Uh, Trimble, SenseFly, EB are a couple of uh, common models here. Generally going to be a few feet wide. Most of them are made out of pretty dense, um, basically really dense styrofoam. Uh, so pretty light, uh, pretty expensive though, about $25,000 on the low end, easily upwards also about 70 or so thousand. Uh, and they're sufficient for, uh, in terms of accuracy, generally going to be good for contouring type projects. Now looking at the, the pros and cons here, um, Small multi-rotor, uh, you know, spoiler alert, these are the ones that we were big fans of because of those, uh, those factors that I talked through before. They deliver great accuracy. Um, they are really easy to use, really easy to learn. They're super reliable and they're inexpensive. Um, these you know, smaller multi-rotors, they, they tend to just work because they're really, really mass produced. So they've worked out a lot of the kinks uh, and they have the fewest, the fewest kind of interchangeable or moving parts to break. The main drawback of that, though, is flexibility. These really are one type of tool for one type of job. They're not a jack of all trades. Uh, in our experience, uh, working with you know, the, the, the broad scope of surveyors we do, most people benefit substantially from these, uh, these small multi-rotors. Uh, they're generally going to get you kind of the, that Goldilocks uh, rain, realm of um, the amount of ground you want to be able to cover, ease of use, accuracy, and the like. Now, large multi-rotors, their main benefit over a small multi-rotor is that they tend to be more customizable. You can swap in different sensors. You can put on all sorts of different kind of widgets and tools and, uh, and technologies. Uh, but that comes with the drawback of, one, they're expensive, and two, because you have the ability to swap in all that stuff and make all these modifications, uh, they tend to have a lot more issues. Um, we, we've seen a lot of this in practice with folks um, you know, going out to, to do a job and then find out that something isn't working. And it may just be as simple as you know, the little servo that triggers the camera that they hooked up you know, is, is slightly off and doesn't quite work right. And you wind up losing a, losing a day in the field because you have to go figure out how to diagnose that and fix it. Um, so, and the other thing to remember is they're not capable, I'll get into this a little bit uh, more in uh, when we talk about sensors, but they're not fundamentally capable of higher accuracy than those small multi-rotors. So you're kind of paying more money um, for not getting for more complication, not necessarily getting better accuracy. Uh, a good good kind of uh, illustration of this is uh, so DJI they make the, the Phantom 4 Pro, which is that small multi-rotor. They also make an M600, which is their their large kind of flying platform that you can put anything on. Uh, and to get the same flight time, the Phantom requires one battery, uh, about $170 for that battery. The, the M600 requires six batteries, uh, and those are pretty expensive batteries. So you're actually flying with $1,200 worth of batteries just to get that M600 in the air uh, in order to cover the same amount of ground that the Phantom 4 Pro can cover with, uh, with one battery. Um, so there are, however, some survey firms for whom this makes sense. Uh, if you do a lot of work that requires really specialized sensors, uh, a good example is, is firms that do a lot of bridge inspection and they need to have a top mounted camera that allows them to go under a bridge and look upwards. Uh, but even in those circumstances, what we would generally recommend is have a small multi-rotor that's your workhorse for your topos, your altas, like, and then have this specialized, uh, larger multi-rotor that you've you know, purposely, purposely built for that, that specific other type of job. Now, fixed wings, the main benefit that they deliver over small multi-rotors is flight time. Um, airplane style airframes are just fundamentally more efficient. They can, they can fly under less power for longer than multi-rotors. Uh, however, um, that range benefit is basically moot uh, because of line of sight regulations. In most contexts, um, a multi-rotor can already fly further than you can keep an eye on it. Uh, and so the fact that you can fly a, a, a fixed wing even farther, it's, it's not that helpful because you can't see it. So you, you're in violation of the law. And, and that is a law that we take very seriously because we've actually had a lot of situations where that, 
uh, that low flying emergency helicopter, that crop duster, or, or you know, some wacko flying their uh, joyriding in their Cessna has come flying through our airspace while we're on a project uh, or even out training with a client. And we need you need to know exactly where your drone is so that you can get out of the way. Uh, now, a couple other factors to keep in mind with a fixed wing, uh, they're generally going to be capable of lower accuracy because they, since they have to maintain a minimum flight speed, uh, they have to fly higher uh, in order to uh, reduce motion blur. And so that's going to reduce uh, the ground resolution that you can get. Uh, they also are not capable of carrying, uh, generally speaking, can't carry a three axis gimbal, which is basically, uh, think of it as uh, for multi rotors, they have the camera on a, um, basically like a gyroscope that allows the camera to stay pointed directly straight down, even as the, the drone fights wind, makes turns, what have you. Uh, fixed wings, some of them have a kind of, it's called a two axis gimbal that allows a little bit of, of motion of that camera, but most of the time that camera is just built into the fixed way, into the airframe. So every little gust of wind is going to cause it to shake and blur a bit. Um, so generally speaking, and they're expensive and uh, because they belly land, they tend to get chewed up pretty quick. Um, so having said that for if you know, if most of what you do are several hundred and larger acre type projects um, and all you need to be getting is one foot contours or so, then uh, fixed wings can be a great tool. Uh, they absolutely have their place. Again, for most surveyors, most projects, we find that uh, that the the small multi-rotor is, is going to be a better fit. Uh, and there are also... Um, a newer type of, of airframe called a, a VTOL fixed wing, vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing that can take off and land like a helicopter, but flies like a fixed wing. It reduces a little bit of the complexity of using it in the field, uh, but you still have all the same issues of, um, of inaccuracy because it's, it's, you know, has that minimum flight speed. So the next, uh, next area of technology to consider, of course, is, is the type of sensor you use. Uh, generally speaking, again, about three categories. You've got uh, cameras that are built for the drone themselves. They're these purpose-built cameras that usually are built into the drone, um, capable of about a tenth accuracy. If part of that small multi-rotor, you're going to be about 4000 bucks all in. Uh, you've got larger third-party cameras. So if you have one of those big fixed-wing airframes, you can carry you know, a digital SLR-type camera. Uh, they're going to be a lot more expensive, also capable of about that same tenth level accuracy. And then you've got LiDAR. Uh, obviously, considerably more expensive. Uh, 170,000 is kind of the minimum of what we've seen, usually closer to a quarter million, uh, and capable of about two to three tenths accuracy. Benefits of that drone specific camera uh, that we found in our field testing um, it's gonna, should sound pretty familiar. It's accurate, it's reliable, it's cheap, it just works. Again, same drawback, plus flexible. Usually, these are cameras that are built into the airframe. Or if they are interchangeable, it's they're kind of uh, they're proprietary, so you can only you know, use that drone manufacturer's couple sensor options. Uh, again, we found most of the time this gets folks what they need with the least amount of headaches and the least cost. Uh, that large third-party camera carrying a big, you know, maybe 40 megapixel uh, camera on a on a large multi-rotor, it has the benefit of gets you that that same 10th level accuracy, but it can get you higher resolution. Now, the reason it doesn't get you better accuracy is because uh, in all the field testing we've done with this, if you fly low with those really large megapixel cameras, they actually wind up having a lot of like noise that causes a lot of error in the photogrammetry process. In order to reduce the kind of noise and warping that happens, you have to fly higher. So you're basically, it, because you're flying, it, when flying higher, if you ground truth, it, it winds up coming in generally pretty similar to those smaller cameras, those about 20 megapixel cameras that you can fly lower but you're going to get higher resolution imagery out of it at that, uh, that altitude that you're flying. Uh, the big reasons though that we shy away from using these, again, comes down to reliability and cost. Uh, by way of example, we did a, a kind of horse race uh, field test between, um, between a Phantom 4 Pro uh, with that built-in camera uh, and a DJI M600 carrying, uh, I believe it was a Sony A6R, pretty massive uh, image sensor. Um, went out to the same project site, set, set a bunch of field test points so that we could, uh, we could measure them against each other using the, the small multi-rotor with that built-in camera, you know, took us about 15 minutes all told, set up, flight, breakdown, 
the large drone with that large third party camera that had been custom built into it, uh, they wound up having to come back four times uh, because each time they went out to fly the site, something didn't work. And I had to, they had to spend a couple of days diagnosing it and trying to fix it. Finally, on the fourth, the fourth visit, they managed to actually collect the data. And this was a very experienced team, uh, a lot of drone experience, um, very well qualified engineering team. Uh, but finally, on that fourth visit, they were able to collect the data, but half of the photos were inexplicably blurred. And that's not because, you know, it, who knows why that was. They were never actually able to diagnose what the issue was. Uh, but the thing to take away from that is when you wind, when you have a lot of custom integrations, there's just a lot more stuff that can go wrong. Um, last option, obviously, we get a lot of questions about LiDAR. Main benefit is that it can shoot through some ground cover, uh, but there's a lot of drawbacks. Uh, they're really expensive. Uh, the field tested accuracies uh, that we're seeing are not, not as good as you can get out of uh, uh, using photogrammetry. Again, you've got a lot of these kind of custom integration uh, challenges and issues. Uh, data processing uh, with these massive point clouds is also really, really time intensive. Um, so, I mean, there, we have, we know some, you know, there's, there's going to be a small proportion of surveyors who this may make sense for. If you do frequent work in sparse vegetation and have a ton of experience, both with custom drone building and with uh, managing point clouds, if you do a lot of mobile uh, scanning, that could be a good fit. Um, you know, digging into this a little bit more, we're, again, we're, we're independent, you know, if, if um, it's not like we're in the uh, in the pocket of the photogrammetry association of america or something like that uh the reason we're waiting on lidar is we just we haven't seen it pan out to be a good investment yet for a couple key reasons uh the ground cover penetration uh that we've seen using this in, these in real world circumstances generally hasn't been great uh it's important to recognize to, to remember that uh the the LIDAR that you can put on a drone has to be a lot smaller than what you can put on an, uh, an airplane or a helicopter. And it has to be a lot, it can't be nearly as powerful because weight is so much more of an issue on a, on a smaller drone than on a big helicopter or airplane. And that translates to, you know, the kind of beam density, the power of that LIDAR isn't as powerful as what you all are accustomed to seeing from, uh, you know, from that, that airplane or helicopter based LIDAR. So it doesn't shoot through as much ground cover as effectively, uh, and it's also just not as accurate, again, because it, it can draw as much power. And they're really expensive, uh, you know, again, easily quarter million dollars, even upwards of a half million dollars. So to make that make financial sense, it, it just kind of, it doesn't pencil out right now. So we're excited about LiDAR. We're, you know, constantly doing the testing we can on it, keeping a prize, you know, talking to our, uh, our friends who are out, actually out developing this technology. Uh, but right now we're we're saying let's let's wait on that until the prices come down, the easy use goes up, the uh, the accuracy and ground penetration gets better. So takeaway from this, you know, our, our recommendation to folks who are starting out is frankly start simple. You know the KISS uh, ethos: keep it simple, stupid. Use technology that's that's proven, that's reliable, that's cheap and easy today, that that delivers the results you need. Start so benefiting from that now, learning kind of, you know, there's still a fair bit of learning curve that goes into understanding how to use this in, the, in your business. Uh, so you invest in inexpensive proven technology that gets you the results you need and allows you to build that institutional know-how. And then once you've kind of proven out the ROI, once you've, you've started really benefiting from that, then maybe it's worth looking into some of this more advanced technologies because you're gonna have a lot better idea of where you need to optimize. But I would, I would caution you away from saying like, you know, a lot of times we'll hear folks say like, well, I want to get the one drone that I'm going to be able to use for, you know, forever for the next 20 years. And there's, there's not a compelling reason to do that because right now you can get industry best accuracy with an inexpensive drone uh, with those small multi-rotors. Uh, and by the time that, you know, LiDAR matures a few years from now, potentially, they're going to be better airframes out there anyway. So it makes sense to really focus on getting the right tool for the job at the time that it, uh, that, that tool is mature. So on that note, you know, now that you've kind of built out or figured out what technology you're going to use, uh, you get into picking your projects, how, how to know which the right projects to use. And there's a couple key factors here, the law and profit or benefit. In terms of the law, uh, you know, we could easily spend several hours on this. Key highlights to have in mind are one, as I mentioned before, line of sight. 
the entire time the drone is flying, you need to be able to see it. So that's going to mean there's some project that are you know, maybe really big or really obscure that it doesn't make sense to use the drone on. Um, one, uh, one law that we get a lot of confusion on is flights over property. Technically, legally, as a, um, a licensed commercial drone pilot, you are, a, you are legally entitled to fly over anybody else's property. Um, nobody owns the, the, the airspace is federally managed and federally controlled. So you don't, you're not required to get permission from landowners or, or managers to fly over their property. Having said that, the, the, the law or the rule of, of being a good neighbor applies. So generally, you know, if you're going to be, the, the drone might pass briefly over the corner of somebody's property, or you just need to get, you know, a little bit of data on the other side of some fences to know how water is going to flow. It's, it happens so quickly, the drone's flying so high that it's, it's not worth worrying about. Uh, but if you're gonna be you know, covering an entire neighborhood or something like that, it's a good idea to let folks know just so that you're being a responsible operator. We, we have, fa have found in, in real world circumstances, very, 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 very few issues. If you're out there and you're wearing your vest, working out of your truck, following your you know, standard operating procedures, acting like a professional, the most generally you're going to get are some, you know, some kind of curious questions. Rarely do we see any, uh, any real issues there. Uh, flights over non-participants. So letter of the law is the drone can't cross a column of air directly above a human being or moving vehicle who is not directly involved in that operation. It's very, very, very specific. Um, this is one where we, you know, what we've heard from the FAA is what they want to see is good, safe practice. Uh, they want to see responsibility. So if, have it, you know, if using the drone to survey a, uh, an intersection uh, and a couple of cars pass by that might pass underneath the drone while it's flying, uh, but that means that you don't have to put a surveyor in the middle of that intersection, uh, that's a net benefit for human safety. So that's, they're generally going to look favorably on that. But, you know, if you, there's certainly circumstances that are still not appropriate to use a drone. Uh, surveying a, a busy highway, not, not a good idea, not safe. Uh, if you need to survey a you know mall parking lot or or something like that, choose a time of day when you're gonna have the least amount of traffic going by. And the last up is is airspace. Uh, this is pretty nuanced, but the FAA has rolled out uh, actually just just as of a few weeks ago. It's now live over the uh, at most airports in the country. Uh, a system called Lance L A A N C that allows you to get instant authorization to fly uh, pretty close to most airports in the country, which is where most of the, the flight, the airspace limitations are. So over on the right-hand side of the slide, there's a, I uh, pulled the air, one of the airspace grids. Uh, and you can see, this is around an airport, and you can see there are these different numbers in these boxes. Around the further edges, it says 200, and then you, as you get closer, 100 or zero. That's basically telling you what your ceiling is uh, to fly in that area. Uh, and there's some simple tools such as air map that you can use to get instant authorization to fly up, up to that ceiling in that area. And you're going to have a different grid like this with different ceilings uh, for pretty much every airport in the country. But the good news here is whereas previously there were a lot of restrictions saying pretty much anywhere near an, airplane, uh, an airport was a no-fly zone, now it's actually much more permissive. Um, but there is just this kind of instant authorization step you have to go, to, go through. Outside of that, it is possible to apply for special authorizations from the FAA or from the local tower to get permission to fly kind of outside of that, that scope. Those are the key regulatory factors to have in mind when you're kind of doing that, that project planning. Uh, and then the other part of this, of course, is where it actually takes to, to use it on the field. Uh, so thinking about how to make sure that, that this is going to be, a, you know, that it's going to be profitable to use the drone or efficient to use the drone on that project requires knowing what it actually takes to use it on, on that project. So thinking specifically about these, these first three steps of the drone workflow that are, that are involved in actually collecting the data, uh, the first step in that project planning I talked about earlier is figuring out kind of what the spec is of your project to what accuracy you need. And this table, this summarizes a ton of field testing we've done using uh, uh, the, those small multi-rotors um, to just kind of establish some benchmarks uh, for accuracy expectations. Now, accuracy is really, really complicated. Uh, ultimately, the best way to know what your accuracy is on a project is always to set some ground check shots to measure against. Uh, the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, ASPRS, has a set of standards that they recommend that, uh, that we've found really reliable called the position, positional accuracy standards for measuring that. That's what we use to do this benchmarking. Uh, but for the sake of just setting expectations, um, we'll use this 
uh, this, this kind of table to uh, to estimate for planning new projects. So if if you're you know the first thing you'll notice here is that there's a trade-off between the accuracy you can get and the amount of ground you can cover uh, per battery, uh, which with that Phantom 4 Pro is about 17 minutes in real world terms. If you need max, maximum accuracy, you should expect, you should rely on, is about a tenth. It's obviously always going to be a bit better than that on hardscape. Um, but if you assume a tenth vertical, you're generally going to be happy or pleasantly surprised. Um, if you need to get that tenth level accuracy, fly at, at uh, what we recommend is kind of your floor of 100 feet above ground, and you can cover about five acres per battery. If, however, you need, you have a larger project or you just need one foot contours, you can fly up at 400 feet, which is the ceiling, you cover 10 times as much ground, and you'll still be at, from our testing, about four tenths or even a little bit better. So certainly good enough for one foot contours. So the implication of this is the higher you fly, the less time it takes you. And that means, you know, remembering back that we said the main benefit for this tool is saving time, uh, that's where your real benefit comes from. So the first thing you want to think about on a project is, for this project, or even just the parts of this project that I want to use the drone on, what is the actual accuracy that I need? Do I need to be at maximum accuracy, or do I want to do take my, my critical shots on the ground, my building corners, my ADA ramps and the like, and then rely on the drone for uh, filling in the gaps and, and kind of quickly get me contouring on the rest of that project? And that'll be a lot more efficient. And the other implication then of this decision is setting ground control. Now, the number of targets that you that you need to set on a project, it's not a simple targets per acres calculation because it depends on how high you fly. If you fly higher, each photo covers a larger swath of ground. And what actually matters in terms of ground control is how many photos are you stitching together in between those ground control targets, those points of uh, that you've measured really accurately to nail down the model. So the way, the shorthand we use for uh, thinking about project planning is the number of targets per battery. And a simple rule of thumb is you want a minimum of five targets per battery. So again, if you're going for maximum accuracy, you're gonna fly at 100 feet, cover about five acres per battery, you need about five targets. If you're just looking to produce one foot contours, fly up at 400 feet, cover 50 acres, and again, you just need five targets. So again, this you know, further emphasizes the importance of that project planning, that the, the higher you, you determine you can fly, the more time you're going to save because of uh, because you can set fewer targets. So a couple comments on how to how to make sure you get that accuracy. You know, obviously, as you all know from your field, uh, from you know, same is true in, in any sort of uh, data collection collection method, error compounds. So you really want to be vigilant about eliminating sources of error at every step in the process. And a, you know, one of the key places that we see error inter get introduced is where ground control targets are, are set on a project. Generally speaking, you know, we said minimum of five targets per battery, uh, so kind of per flight area. And you always want to make sure you have, a, you have targets around the edge and then interspersed fairly evenly throughout the middle. So you can see on the left-hand side here where this green X is in the middle, that's somewhere where this, on this, uh, this project, uh, we told the client, like, hey, next time, make sure you put an additional target here uh, so that we have, you know, otherwise we had a little bit too much distance between those targets in order to get reliable accuracy. That introduced a bit of error into that area. Um, on the other side, you want to make sure that your targets aren't so close to the edge that they're only captured in a few photos. You want to make sure you overfly past those targets so that they're captured in you know, 9 to 16 photos to make it really reliable to use to nail down the model. Another issue is the type of targets you use. Uh, you want to remember that the way this, this kind of workflow works, uh, you're surveying that target out in the field and then providing those coordinates to a photogrammetrist who's actually looking at the photos, the images of those targets, and selecting a point and inputting those coordinates. So you want to make sure that they are, they are putting those coordinates in at the exact same spot where you measure. So things like on the top left there that don't have a clear center point aren't great because you can't be confident that you're shooting the exact same spot as the field or the photogrammetrist and the field surveyor are taking the exact same shot. Uh, visual ID points, especially like edges of, of pavement and concrete and grates and things like that, can be really hard to communicate. Make sure that you're shooting the right spot. Plus, just a little bit of you know erosion or crumbling of that concrete can introduce a little bit of error. Um, you know, on the bottom left. Chevrons uh, are pretty popular for conventional aerial photogrammetry. We actually find a lot of issues with paint bleeding if they're painted on or even just communicating 
hey, which of these vert, uh, vertices did we shoot? Uh, and then bottom right, uh, that was one that got a, a laugh in the office. One of our, one of our clients uploaded a, a project and we discovered that they took the ground control target very literally and said, oh yeah, just make sure you, you know, it's a, uh, we shot the center of mass for the ground control coordinate. Obviously pretty challenging for the photogrammetrist to make sure they, they get the exact same spot. So we're not a, we generally recommend not using targets like these. What we love, what we find that the easiest targets to use. So something that's a checkerboard pattern makes it, it is unambiguously obvious which, you know, where the center point is. And um, you can buy black and, you know, this is actually a, a photo of a black and white linoleum kitchen tile, 12 by 12 inches. You can get them at Home Depot for 65 cents each and they work fantastically. So that makes using something like this, make sure that you know that the field surveyor and the photogrammetrist are, are shooting the exact same spot. So you're actually, you know, your workflow here, again, rule of thumb, five targets per battery. You want to make sure you've got all the corners nailed down on that project, uh, or, or uh, rather targets, just uh, targets at the corners of the project and then interspersed through the middle. You want to make sure you extend your flight pattern beyond the, the edges of the project by at least one, kind of one pass, and make sure you're using those targets that have an obvious center point. Once you've done that, setting up and flying the drone, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're a big fan of lawnmower flight patterns, just the back and forth. You don't need to do like a cross hatch. Um, it actually, you know, th there's not much benefit in our experience on the accuracy, and it just means you're spending more time out in the field. 75% um, front and side overlap we find works most can, you know, is the most efficient, gets us the right amount of data without having too much data. Uh, and when we do the data processing, we find that nadir only, so straight down shots, get us the most reliable accuracy. Uh, of course, gonna, it's going to mean that you're, you, know, you can't use it to model the sides of buildings, uh, but you know, we're really focused on a drone as a kind of topo and, uh, and planometrics uh, tool. Just getting uh, running low on time. So walk through a quick example of that project planning and then uh, pause for quite, uh, or take uh, end there and take questions. Um, so let's take a, an Alta as an example of, of how you kind of do that project planning. Uh, this is about a 13 acre office park. Uh, it's worth even, you know, just kind of pausing here and thinking about when you're doing an Alta, making this decision about where do I, what am I, what data am I going to rely on the drone for versus what am I going to collect in the field? You know, on almost every project, there are always going to be shots you need to collect in the field. Now, if we assume that the best accuracy you can get is about a, is a, a tenth vertical, that's not going to be good enough for building corners. And a lot of times building corners are underneath eaves, so you can't even reliably capture them from the drone. So if you're looking at this project thinking like, well, let's just think about field uh, about uh, parking stalls versus building corners. Now, the, there are 10 buildings here, so 40 building corners, uh, and there are 460 parking stalls. So again, building corners, can't rely on the drone because it's not high enough accuracy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot those in the field. But 10th accuracy on parking stalls, sure, plenty good for, uh, for that, that purpose. Just by doing that, you reduce the number of field shots you need to make, you need to take while you're out there by 460, right? So 460 parking stalls, 40 building quarters, that's 500, field, that's 500 survey shots. So if you can rely on the drone for just those 460 parking stalls, you just reduce your shot list by 90% that's going to dramatically reduce the amount of time you're spending out in the field on this project. So how I would kind of think about attacking this project, again, we're looking at about 13 acres, um, you know, some limitations to be mindful of. Definitely if you're thinking about an office park, you wanna pick a time of day where you're reducing operations over non-participants. Uh, I'm gonna fly for maximum accuracy, so I'm gonna fly at 100 feet. That means I'm gonna to need to go through about or that total flight time would be about 45 minutes, so I'll need to go through three batteries. So I know I need to set about 15 targets. So in terms of thinking, is this gonna be a profitable project? Well, to set 15 targets, figure two and a half, three hours or so of walking around setting those targets, surveying them in. The actual drone set of a flight, 45 minutes to an hour or so. I've now with a few hours worth of uh, basically drone operation time, I've collected parking stalls, build it, um, a lot of my curb lines, building drip lines, if, if those are something I need, utility locates. Um, I can, I'm now allowed, or I can you know, now prioritize my field time on collecting those critical high accuracy shots, and I've reduced my total time pretty dramatically. 
other end of the spectrum, another quick example, uh, a large topo type project. I think this was a, uh, an area that was being developed for construction, if memory serves, is what the ultimate output looked like. About 145 acres, uh, limitations here. Big ones can be line of sight in terms of regulations. So you're going to want to move around the site and do your drone flights from different places so you can make sure you have a, an eye on the drone the entire time. But again, for 145 acres, my main goal here is for planning. I'm going to focus on just getting good enough data for one foot contours. So uh, fly up at 400 feet, and that means I can cover this entire 145 acres and about three batteries again. So all I need here are about 15 targets. Uh, because again, target, the number of ground control targets you need depends on how high you fly. Uh, so factoring or thinking about it just per battery, five targets per battery, so you need about 15 targets. Maybe round up, call it. 17 to 20. So again, setting ground control is going to take a bit more time. So you've got to travel around a bit more. Doing the drone flight is going to take a bit more time too because you need to you know, fly the drone in one area, then pack it up, move to a different area and fly it there. But you're still looking at a few, you know, figure a day worth of work that's going to collect most of your, most of your field data. So with that, I'll just make sure. You know, there's plenty to get into in terms of the um, what that data processing workflow involves, the photogrammetry, drafting line work, and finishing it in CAD. Very short version of the tools we use when we do this uh, as a service. We're big fans of PIX4D to do that photo stitching. Software we use to actually draft on top of the digital surface model then is called Virtual Surveyor, and you can output just straight CAD data from there. So why don't I pause there, uh, and uh, Kayla, were there questions that folks had? Sure. Thank you, Daniel, for that presentation. Um, so, yes, we will now go ahead and moderate questions to our presenter. Um, if you have any questions, I'll give you a minute or two to go ahead and type those into the question box at this time, and I will moderate them to Daniel. Thank you. Hey, Kayla, if there are not questions, um, I could go, I could take a, a few more minutes and go more in depth on so that data processing process. Yeah, it looks you wanna, like, Should I do that or should we well, wait we for, couple, uh, we wait for questions? We just got a couple that came in. Um, so okay. we get through the questions and we still have a bit of a time left. Definitely, you could go back and touch on some more points. Um, sure. So it looks like you mentioned the field time you were saving using the drone. Um, but you didn't talk about the processing time it takes to get the photogrammetry product to CAD. I guess is a question. Sure. So that's great. That'll that'll prompt me to uh, let me just flip back and go a little bit more into that. Obviously, you know, trying to cover a ton of material here. So forgive me for for not getting through everything in as much depth as I would love to. Uh, but yeah, that, I mean that's a great question. After you fly the drone, you basically got hundreds or even thousands of photos, and you need to now get that into CAD. So there's a few critical steps here, stitching those photos together into that 3D model, reducing that down into CAD manageable line work and bringing it over into CAD. And this is one of these things where there's a lot of, a lot of ways to skin that CAD. We see a lot of folks use different workflows. You can, um, the, the, the process we prefer is stitching those photos together in a software like PIX4D and outputting what's called a digital surface model, which is basically like a, a really dense 3D mesh. Um, and then uh, the software we use is called Virtual Surveyor uh, to draft on top of that and output into CAD. There are other workflows like uh, DataMate is a software provider that allows you to mark features on the, the original photos. Uh, and then when you stitch it together, it creates that, that line work. We found that workflow to be a lot less, uh, less user-friendly and efficient. Uh, and then a lot of, uh, the, the one that a lot of folks start off with is actually working on the point cloud. So, PIX4D uh, and pretty much any other of these photo stitching softwares, as a byproduct of how they do that photo stitching, they create a point cloud. Um, we are not big fans of working on a point cloud because they're so massive and dense to work with. Uh, and the process you have to go through to reduce that down into something that, that's actually manageable to bring into CAD is, is really, really intensive. So instead, um, we effectively in PIX4D, you can, you can uh, have it convert into what's called the digital surface model. It's basically like running a really dense 3D mesh over the top of that. 
uh, of that point cloud. And it's when you output, output that into virtual surveyor where you actually draft the line work, it's a lot lighter weight, a lot uh, easier to manage. So that's what the tools are that we use. Now, in terms of time, I, I mean, yeah, th there's no two ways around it. Around it, that data processing process, it's pretty, it's pretty intensive. Um, just the computer horsepower you need to do that, the photo stitching um, is is a lot. Uh, we have a lot of basically like high end gaming computers with top end CPUs and GPUs that are just crunching away on data all day. Um, there's a lot of manual work that goes into marking ground control, running QA, QC, making sure that you don't have errors happening in that photogrammetry process, and then drafting the line work. Um, you're basically simulating what you would do in the field by you know, shooting spot elevations, dropping a, a grid, marking out where your break lines are and the like. Uh, it's much faster to do that on the computer than, on, uh, than in the field, but it is still a considerable amount of time. So it, it, there's a bit of kind of rebalancing. If you do all this yourself in house, there's a bit of rebalance, rebalancing from field time to office time. Um, but it is, you know, the, your net time is still going to uh, be considerably, uh, considerably less. And of course, office time is, is cheaper than, than field time. Um, you know, so even if you are doing it in house, there are some benefits to that. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and in that explanation, you kind of answered another question um, that someone had on whether or not you use point cloud data. Um, so thank you for also mm -hmm. touching on that, too. Another question that we have, though, is when you create a DSM and export to virtual surveyor, is there any benefit in using the DSM versus ortho photos? Are you creating 3D line work or just plain um, planimetric line work? Yeah, so Virtual Surveyor allows you to actually draft in three dimensions. Uh, so rather than in, let me actually pull up a little screenshot here of what that software looks like over on the right hand side. There we go. Uh, so basically, you know, just a quick visual here of what you can do in Virtual Survey. You can actually drop those, uh, those field shots, those yellow crosses. Uh, most of those are dropped as a grid. Um, and it's just like you were out walking grid in the field, taking those spot elevations. Uh, and then you can draft in things like your brake lines, your curve lines, all in three dimensions. So generally what we'll do, most of the time we use virtual surveyor, certainly for dropping spot elevations and drafting and, uh, and brake lines and creating that, that kind of simplified surface. And then um, for the 2D features, so if we just need, you know, for an Alta, for example, we just need, you know, edge of pavement and parking stalls, utilities, all that, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll just uh, we'll sometimes create a uh, or pull the ortho photo directly into CAD and draft on top of it, um, or but sometimes you even have to reduce the size of that, so it's easier actually just to even do that work in Virtual Surveyor, which is designed for that that denser data. Great. Um, I think those are all of the questions. We do still have seven more minutes. If there's something else you wanted to touch on or if you wanted to um, give folks another minute or two to kind of write those questions in while you give us, wrap us up just a little bit. Um. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't mind hanging tight and waiting. And, and I, uh, you know, as, as Kayla mentioned before, I'm, I'm happy to, I'll be sending the, the, this presentation out to everybody who wants it after the fact. Um, and certainly, of course, if more questions come up as you're thinking about this later or looking through that, I'm uh, more than happy to, to answer questions folks have later via email or phone. Um, let, me, let me see, is there anything else that I'm not through? It looks like we had another um, one you know, that did come in to actually do mm -hmm. while you were talking. Sure. Uh, so this one is, do the exported DSMs include items like trees or other vegetation? And if so, at what point are those removed? Yeah, great question. So yeah, I think what, what's underlying that question is kind of uh, how to deal with ground cover when you're using a photogrammetry drone. And, and it's important to understand that, you know, as with conventional photogrammetry, ground cover is a fundamental limitation of this technology. Uh, you know, if you fly a photogrammetry or a camera drone over a, uh, a dense forest, um, and then stitch that together, it's going to confidently create a model of the tops of the trees, which is not terribly helpful. Um, so there's a couple ways to think about it. That though, uh, I mean, one is as part of that project planning process, a uh, critical question to ask is like, what parts of this project am I going to rely on the drone for, versus what areas am I going to plan to collect data in the field? 
um, at when you're on site, um, a good kind of rule of thumb is if you walk through some trees and you look up and you can see a few square feet of of sky, then you will be able to, you know, in software like virtual surveyor, you can drop a spot elevation pretty reliably down in that gap. Um, or if you have kind of, uh, you know, a, a wheat field or something like that, where you have pretty uniform height of, of ground cover, uh, you can basically just offset the model down by the height of that grass or that wheat. Uh, that does absolutely introduce a bit of, a bit more error and a bit of noise. So it's something that you have to be done uh, very kind of consciously and thoughtfully. Um, but to, to answer the, that critical question of, kind of how are trees removed, again, it goes back to using that, that the, or at least in the workflow that, that we find most effective, using that, that virtual surveyor software uh, on top of the digital surface model. What we're actually doing is we're picking the spots that we are going to export out into CAD. So it's, you don't have to go through this process of like removing things. You're actually just choosing the points that you care about. So obviously I'm not going to drop us. I'm not going to put a spot elevation on top of that tree. I'm going to put spot elevations around the tree or as close as I can. So that when I then create a tin, uh, uh, create a surface from those spot elevations, it's basically just going to interpolate through that when I bring it over into CAD. Uh, so it's not about, it's not about like removing the tree like you would have to in a point cloud where you're classifying points and deleting them and things like that. Instead, you're actually picking the data. When we do this for our clients, we're picking the shots uh, that we want the model to be based on, just like you would do in the field. In the field, you're not gonna climb up on top of a tree and take a, and, uh, you know, shoot a, or take a shot on top of that tree. Uh, you're going to selectively choose the points that you wanna base your surface on. Fundamentally the same logic when working on that digital surface model. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, I believe that those are all of the questions that we have for today's session. Um, and again, you'll be hearing from Daniel soon. If you do have any other questions, feel free to shoot them his way um, or direct them to us and we'll be happy to get them over to Daniel. Um, so thank you again for leading our session. I just have a couple of reminders here. Once the webinar ends, there will be a short quiz that pops up, which is required to take in order to receive your CEU for attending today. Um, with that, there's also a short survey included, um, and we do appreciate your feedback on this session as well as any ideas you may have for future topics. Um, watch for an email sometime next week that we will send. It will include today's recording and your CEU certificate that you're earning today. So that will conclude today's session. Thank you all for joining us.